Bonjour. Bonjour. <laughs> uh, uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here this morning with me. It's Friday morning. There was a wonderful party last night celebrating Les Cecis' 16th birthday. I'm very honored to be on the stage to have a chance to talk to you, really. And what we're going to talk about today, hopefully, is a big idea that you think is interesting. I, I certainly do. And what I want to do is talk about how we together, as friends, can really deal with this evolving adversary, the evolving dark market or the, or the bad guys. And what I want to do is set some context uh, before we kick it off. You know, of course, we're in the digital age. I, I think you all feel that. You, some of you may have smart watches. You all have smartphones, I'm sure. And as I was walking here from the hotel, you guys all walk here from the hotel. There's a beautiful ocean, the Riviera. It's a fantastic sunrise. And as I'm walking, enjoying this wonderful view, this wonderful nature, I get a text message from Raphael, our, our, uh, our sales leader for the South, saying, hey, are you, are you ready? Where are you? <laughs> I'm like, I'm trying to enjoy nature, and yet we're surrounded, surrounded by the digital age. You can't get away from it. You know, the dig it's so powerful that we call it the fourth Industrial Revolution. And I don't know if you guys remember the first Industrial Revolution. I don't think so. That was in like 1760, when water and power helped make us more productive as, as people, right? Water powering machines and electricity. The fourth Industrial Revolution is now in the digital age. And it's so important to us because it's helped us drive this economy that we live in today. And it's so fast. The productivity gains are so high. It's greater than the first three industrial revolutions. I'll give you an example of how powerful this, this is, right? Who here has heard of an app called Uber? I'm from San Francisco, <laughs> all right? And Uber started in San Francisco. Uber, for us, uh, in the United States at least, means you get to call a limo with your phone. If you think about what Uber has done, right, some of you may agree with it or not agree with it, Uber is completely changing the taxi industry, right? You can now schedule a, a, a ride with a, a black car or UberX, and they'll come pick you up. And it's using software technology built on smartphones. It's using the hardware that's available on those smartphones to track where you are. And it can take you from your home to the airport, it can pick you up from the bar to go home. It's super convenient, and I love it. Right? Well, that power and that technology and convenience that we're used to is creating this trust. Right? I trust that I can, can get Uber and get a ride any, any time. Now, let me give you another example. Right now, if you use your smartphone, you can go on your banking app and you can check in your bank account. And if each and every one of you checked your account right now and you said, oh, I've got 1,000 euros in my account, and a second later, you refresh, and the 1,000 euros became zero euros. I bet you everybody would get up and walk out the door. Like, what happened, right? So there is a fine line to this power. The same power that's giving us productivity can be the same power that's used to remove it, take away that productivity, right? We don't use money anymore. There's no euros anymore. It's all bits and bytes somewhere in the internet, somewhere in the cloud. And that's really a problem for us. It's not really about the breaches. You've seen the news, there's lots of breaches, yes. It's really what's a result of these breaches, right? Trust is, is, is going away. We're losing trust in the digital age. We're losing trust in our ability to think that, hey, that money's gonna be there. We trust that it's gonna be there. We trust that when we call Uber, it's gonna come. We trust that the phone will work anywhere in the world. That, that's an inherent trust that's slowly eroding. And it's such a big problem that governments have to think about this. Certainly here in, in, in the EU, in France in particular, you're looking at privacy laws, you're looking at compliance laws, you're looking at different rules and regulation that's trying to figure out how do we do this? How do we moderate the loss of trust in the digital age? You know, our CEO, Mark McLaughlin at Powelton Networks, has a second job. His second job is 
He's a chairman of the Cybersecurity Advisory Board for President Barack Obama. And in those meetings, what the President of the United States talks about is the fact that trust is bleeding away slowly. And as trust bleeds away slowly, it threatens our way of life. It threatens productivity in the fourth industrial revolution. Recently, over the last two years or three years, the US uh, Department of Commerce did a survey. And what the survey showed was for the first time in two years that the usage and reliance and trust on digital technology within the financial and healthcare sector actually declined. This has never happened before. And that's just an example of the risk that we face if we don't do something about this. And the governments are really concerned about it. So concerned that countries like France has a fourth division of the military now. It's no longer just the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines. It's now cyber. France has a cyber command. The US has a cyber command. We have warriors to focus in on cybersecurity for, for national reasons, for, for, nation, for their security of the country. This is, this is not just us uh, as sort of friends of the Western world. We've got countries that are considered third world countries now that are really investing in cyber capabilities. Countries like Syria, North Korea, who know they're, they're not going to be able to compete on a physical level, right, with physical warfare. They're investing in cyber because that's something they can do. And they're investing heavily in cyber to compete with us. That's something we have to be very aware of, and the governments are fully aware of that. This is a problem that's in boardrooms as well, right? Many of you have your managers and bosses, and they're on the board, right? They're part of committees built to focus on cyber risk for your companies. Th this is telling, right? This, this means that this is a big problem, and the me measure of risk around cyber is, in fact, not just government, not just consumer related, but very much enterprise related. And I think when you think about this, cyber from a technology perspective is so powerful. And this conference has been around for 16 years. This is so prevalent. You know, we don't have presidents talking about uh, cloud computing, right? They talk about cybersecurity. They don't build military branches focused on mobility or, or bring your own devices, right? And there's no board, boardrooms with subcommittees focused on software-defined networks. These are all technolog technology advances. But it's, it's important, but not as important as cyber. So why is this happening? As we enjoy the conveniences of technology, we enjoy the fourth industrial revolution with SaaS and cloud computing, with IoT, internet devices. Last night we saw this wonderful drone take a video view of the party and, and show it on a massive screen. What, what a beautiful sight. And of course, our conveniences with our mobile devices. All of these things are fantastic, but they're also huge opportunities, huge opportunities for the adversary. This shift, th this storm of new technology and new use cases is driving us to be more productive, but it's also creating opportunities for the bad guys at the same rate or, or more. And so I think there are definitely three critical challenges uh, around security, right? Physical and cyber blending together, especially around Internet of Things types of technologies. And we saw this a couple of days ago in the news where now you have Mirai, a botnet storm capability that's built for IoT devices, not laptops or desktops or servers, but free software now available for the adversary to use, to use IoT devices, use your refrigerators and your thermostats to attack websites, attack corporations. And, and it was successful in taking down several networks. You have data that's ma massively available for everybody, available for us, but available for the adversary as well. And compute is now limitless, right? Limitless. You, you, can, you can scale up compute at any time using AWS, using Azure, using other public clouds. 
it's amazing, right? And it's an amazing opportunity for us, but it's, it's a challenge for sure. And I think the, the big takeaway for me around this is if you think about security, it's certainly organic, it's us, it's the people, and it's, it's really like fabric that is the underlining foundation of everything we do. And I use this analogy because fabric, the pattern is beautiful, and if you want to make a change, you really can't change it, right? You can't cut or rip the fabric and stitch something in. Security has to be designed in from the very beginning. If you forget about it or you didn't do it correctly, you really can't change it. It's very difficult. And this is not today, this is certainly within the next five years, within the next 10 years, who knows? This is here to stay. So what, what are we gonna do, right? I mentioned big ideas. I think this is a time when we have to think differently. Things that we think worked five, 10 years ago may not work the same today. Defense in depth, which is powerful, may not be effective against an automated attack that's highly targeted, highly distributed. It just may not work as well. We have to have big ideas about how to handle this. Right? We have to be open-minded. And I think when you think about how important this is, I'll use an example of the math problem. Right? It's simple math. The number of successful attacks are increasing rapidly, and the cost of launching those attacks are decreasing at the same rate. And so if you're the bad guy and you want to launch an attack, it's very simple. You don't have to invest in any hardware. You don't have to invest in much resources. It's completely automated. And you can subscribe to some services and compute and storage to do this. And it's, it's very successful and it's very cheap. All right? we, we really have to do something about this. And from our perspective, we think you've got to change the model. You have to change the equation. You have to make it extremely hard to be successful. Make it hard for them to launch attacks. And you have to make it expensive. If you can change that equation, I think we've got a better shot at dealing with this. So this formula, this math problem has to change. And how do we do that? So I think there's three key things that we can do to change that math problem, to change that equation. Certainly there's education, and it's education at all levels, not just with us as operators of our environments, right? Not just the practitioners or the network and security architects or the CISOs. It's at the board levels. It's at policymakers. It's governments. It's CEOs. And of course, threat sharing is important. We'll talk some more about threat sharing, what it means. But I think it's the action that you take from the information you collect and share. It's not just the actual data. And finally, I think we have to, we have, to have a prevention mindset. Right? You can't just assume that detection and remediation is going to solve the problem. You really have to think about what, do we, what should we do to prepare? How do we prevent? And I, and I want to push on this point around prevention, because I think prevention is an idea that you guys probably heard of if you've been in security like me for the last 20 years. It's kind of gone through its cycles, right? I think finally we've got technology, and we've got the right balance of automation to make prevention real and make it effective. And I think we have to start thinking that way because I think just being reactive and manual with legacy approaches isn't enough against an automated attack. The math problem doesn't work anymore, right? Using just point products that are stitched together for detection isn't going to be effective enough when you are bombarded with millions and millions of hits by an, a machine that's coming after you, right? Humans versus machines, you're not gonna win. So I think we have to think differently. We have to have a big idea, right? It's not just next-gen technology, it's not just platform and prevention, it's really a combination of things that allows you to be more proactive, allows you to prepare and prevent, and it's automated. And that word, automation, in security is a bad word. I know a lot of you, I've talked to some of you about this this week. And there's some folks that are extremely forward leading. Some folks that are, are still really reserved about, hey, do I want to automate? Do I want to prevent, right? And I'll give, you, I'll give you a story. I talked to a customer that's here with us here at LACCS. He gave me a really good analogy. It was a really great idea. He said, look, 
us as cybersecurity professionals, we really need to think about this as the way firefighters think about protecting the forest. You guys have wonderful, beautiful forests in Provence. You have a beautiful gorge, Du Verdun. I've been there three years ago. After Les Assis, I went with my wife and visited Provence. It's absolutely beautiful. And one of the things that your, for your firefighters do is they prepare that forest. When it's too dry, they manage the dry growth by cutting it away or managing the burn. They educate the village, they educate the villagers and people that visit to say, hey, look, be careful with the fire, right? We, we want to avoid everything burning down. And I, I'm very familiar with this. Being from, from California, where we have no rain for four years, forest fires happen, and thousands and thousands of acres of land burn. But if you manage it, you have a better chance of preventing forest fires. And firefighters will tell you that that's an effective way. I mean, I thought that was a great, great way to think about our problem. Right? We want to stop forest fires. We want to stop successful cyber attacks. And if you think about that, the preparation that you do up front can pay a nice ROI later because you don't have fires. Right? So that's a great story, a great analogy. I just got that yesterday in a meeting. And I think having that kind of mindset is a, is a very different approach from what we've thought used to work, right? We have limited visibility, you can't have that. We have, we don't really correlate very well. There's a lack of really good correlation. The correlation isn't good enough to take action, that's a problem. And today's action is very manual, right? You all want to have some person's eyes to look at the problem and decide, should I block this, should I not block it? And, and I think all of you know this, that it's really hard to hire security talent. You want to hire security professionals that can tell you is this good or bad? It's very difficult. There's just not enough people in France to do this. Right? Every one of you probably have job openings in your companies to hire some young, new cybersecurity professional. And now they're really expensive and really rare. We have to figure out how to do this better. So recently, last year, we did a study with Panama Institute. And what we did is we surveyed hackers, 2,500 hackers around the world. And we said, all right, let's, let's figure out what the economics of hacking is, right? What are they really after? And some of the results actually made some sense to me, right? And I'm gonna share these with you. The data that we collected showed us that if we were able to hold off the bad guy for 40 hours or more, 60% of them would move on. The math problem with flip, it becomes not worth it, too expensive. There's much better ways to make money. And 69% said if they attack and they see that you've got preventative capabilities in your environment and it's formidable, it's strong, they would move on. It's not worth it. There's just too many other opportunities. That made a lot of sense. So for me, even having a posture of prevention, the perception of prevention could help. So let me define prevention for you. I think this is really important. So if my big idea is, hey, on a Friday morning, I wanna tell you what prevention means, hopefully I can get that across, right? Four things, very simple. One, you gotta have complete visibility. You can't stop or prevent what you can't see, right? Two, you have to reduce the attack surface. You think like the firefighter that has to cover expansive forests. What could you do to reduce the attack surface? How do you reduce the risk? What could you do to prepare? You have to stop known threats. If you know this is a threat, you know it's bad, why allow it to continue, right? You have to stop it. And of course, the hardest one, the last one, number four, is how do you prevent unknown threats these are the new and unknowns. How do you stop that? And in my definition, what I'm talking about are very specific things, right? When I say visibility, I mean all applications, all users, all content. Encrypted traffic, not just decrypted traffic. SaaS applications, your containers running in the cloud, in public cloud, in private cloud, 
And of course, all mobile devices, all devices that you use to interface, the interactions between the user, the apps, and of course, the data. When I say reducing the attack surface, you, know, you can be smart about how you manage your environment, right? You can enable business apps, you can block bad applications, you can certainly limit the functionality of different types of apps, and of course, limit the types of files. And you, can, you should definitely block websites that you don't want your employees to go to. And when I say prevent known threats, we all know that exploits, we have lists, malware, command and control sites, these are all things that you can get today, right, from various technologies. And of course, stopping unknowns. You, you gotta have a mindset of, if I wanna stop unknown threats, there's certain things I have to be able to do, right? There's no silver bullet, there's not one thing that's gonna work. It's a, a number of things. It's dynamic analysis, static analysis, understanding attack techniques, anomaly detection, machine learning analytics. Those are all critical areas. And you have to do all four things really well. You have to be the best at all four things. So th this really contradicts something that we all once believed, which is, and you may still believe this, that the best technologies are point products. That point products are the answer, not platforms. And I'm here to say that's not true. You have to have a platform, and you have to have a platform that can do all four things really well and be the best at all four areas. And I'm gonna give you an example. So in Silicon Valley, where I work, we have tons of startups in security, tons. Some of them are here. And some of them are really good at malware. Malware detection, analyzing malware, figuring out how to you know, stop that malware. Right? But if you're just really good at malware and you can't see all applications, what good is that? It's not effective. And if you're really good at malware and you see some applications, but you can't unpack encrypted traffic, what's the use of that? I could encrypt malware and get through your network, get through your malware clients, right? your anti-malware clients. And if you're able you know, to stop malware, but you can't get into cloud environments because you don't have that capability, you don't have the APIs built in, how effective would that be? Because we're all moving to the cloud, right? So there's limitations with this. And of course, if you just are able to decipher malware and you don't understand how to deal with unknowns and turn them into knowns, you lose capability there. You have to do all four things. And only a platform can offer that. But a platform itself isn't enough. It has to be a platform that's natively engineered to work together. I'm not talking about go buy this company and buy that security company and then kind of stitch it together. You and I, we, we've lived through this, right? You've been here for 20 years. You've lived through this before. That doesn't work. It's not effective. You have to have an engineered solution that's been designed to do this. And it has continuous improvement and the key is you want it to be able to automate the reprogramming of the technology. It has to be automated. It has to be reprogrammed as fast as possible. Over the last six years, what we've done is really worked on this effort, really figure, try to figure out how do we do this, right? And so with those four prevention values or philosophies in mind, we've created a capability that has about 1.5 billion indicators of compromise that's growing at 150 million per month. And it has a network effect because all of our users share that intelligence with each other. So if one user, one customer sees something bad, it reports it, we see it, and we create a way to stop it. We take an unknown, we make it known, and we reprogram the entire, entire install base, all of our customers' devices and technologies, and we update it so it knows how to block it. That is threat intel sharing, right? It's not the information, it's what you do with the information that matters. Certainly correlation, static dynamic analysis, and machine learning are important. But again, it's what you do with this that makes a difference. And so we have 
very key areas that you want to make sure you enforce, right? If you have the information and you want to take action, you got to be able to do it in a fast way on your network, on your endpoints, in your cloud environments, in your SaaS environments, with your partners. And you have to be able to do this in an automated fashion. And you have to keep security consistent across your segments of your environment, whether it's your endpoints, your internet gateway, your employees and devices, or the data center, or the cloud and SaaS. That consistency is what's going to help you deal with the problems. And so I think when we think about threat intel sharing, the three key things that you want to make sure you can do is you want to turn known threats into unknown threats into known threats. And you want to do that very quickly. You want to automatically share those known threats with as many people as you can. Right? You want to share it with the world. And then you want to be able to automatically use that information and take action. You can't depend on people to take the action. You, you should automate that. Have the devices, have the technology work for you and help you scale. So what we've done at Palo Networks is we created an alliance. We co-founded an alliance called Cyber Threat Alliance with our friends and our, and our competitors, Semantic, Fortinet, and McAfee. And what this alliance is all about is sharing threat intelligence. I'm not talking about uh, virus total. That's free. I'm talking about sharing really high valuable indicators of compromise, high value information on vulnerabilities and exploits and malware. This is really important, right? Some vendors may say, oh, this is, this is our proprietary technology. Why would I share this? We, we say you have to share it. It's our, it's our duty to share this. And so the way this works is every week, we're obligated to hit a certain minimum of top shelf, meaning the best of the best right, indicators that are hard to find, that are very, very new. We share that with each other. And we say, look, let's compete not on the information, because the information needs to be shared. Let's compete on how we, how we deal with the information. What do we do with it? The action that we take is how we compete, right? Because it takes all, all of us, it takes this community to work together to really beat the adversary. So that's what we're trying to do with Cyber Threat Alliance. So my takeaway for you, right, it's my challenge to you guys, is remember this. Next time you talk to your security vendor, ask them if they're part of the Cyber Threat Alliance and if they're sharing threat intelligence with other vendors. Because that, that's what matters. You, you ultimately benefit. The more we do this, the more you benefit. Because then we start to focus on what? How to help you take action faster, right? And you want that. The last piece I want to talk about is really education. So Palo Networks, uh, we wrote a, a book called a Navigating, Navigating the Digital Age in the United States about a year ago. And that was so successful. And the customers say, look, this is really powerful because it helps me talk to my board of directors. It helps you understand what they need to learn so that they can help you. They control the budgets, right? There's policies, there's governance, compliance, and audit. That's what they think about. They think at the risk level. How do you talk to them? How do you explain to them that this is an ongoing problem that needs their support? So we decided to write a book for France also. And we had some amazing partners, amazing authors, and they're listed above. I want to thank them very much for helping us with this and co-produce a book for France so that you all can take one and talk to, to your board to educate them on what they need to know, why this is so important to them. And hopefully you get your budgets to do what you need to do, the people, the process, and the technology to continuously automate and drive that change in your organization. So if you want a book, I think after this talk, it's going to be right outside. You can please take a book. And if you have questions for me, I invite you to come to our booth on the show floor. Please join us. And I, I want to thank you so much for your attention this morning. I know it's tough. It's 9 o'clock in the morning. And you've been a great audience. Thank you so much.